before I start asking, we really want to thank you for being here with us and sharing your time with us and your idea and everything because it's a pleasure. And well, we have we have been studying a little bit your curriculum, so um, we really know that you are really into creativity. So we would like to know how did you get to be to have such a huge interest in creativity? Well. I mean, like most of the things that I really have gotten interested in, that, that came from classrooms. It came from watching teachers try to break out of the mold of, you know, the stereotypical teacher okay, who gets up and puts things on the board and students memorize, etc. Yeah. And, and what impressed me, actually, and what I saw, and maybe it was just an accident, but the teachers I saw were not art teachers or sculpture teachers. They, they were trying to help students come up with creative ideas in science of being able to do this or that, okay, more easily, okay, and creative ideas that, you know, would have solved some problems in history. Mm -hmm. So they were projecting the students into it kind of historical situation, and they said, well, you know, what the real person did was a disaster, okay, because he did it the way they always do it, mm -hmm. and his opponents knew, and they just wiped him out. So what might be a more creative way of trying to deal with this problem, if you were this historical figure? And I thought, that's very interesting. And, I mean, what I realized when I first saw that way, way back in about 1979, 80, school classrooms, I, what I realized was something I had thought of, and that is that creativity is more than just music and art and sculpture and, you know, writing poetry, etc. But creativity can happen everywhere and with everything you do. And that, that brought me really interesting. And it made me realize that, you know, in teaching students, it shouldn't just be critical thinking or how to analyze something, trying to figure out what it says, etc. And creative thinking needs to be there as one of the key types of thinking that you help students also to develop. Mm -hmm. okay. And that... If not only in the classroom, but for the future. Oh, of course, yes. Not just in thinking about it classroom stuff. Because of my interest in, in the curriculum and making it work better, that's what I focus on. But carrying it out of the classroom into everyday life, mm -hmm. okay, many teachers are trying to do that with the students. You know, how could you do something like that, you know, at home on the weekend? Yes, okay. exactly. And that was pretty cool. So. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the relationship between philosophy and creativity. So how how do you think that those two things get together? How do you, like the philosophical development or skills can help to develop creativity? Well, I mean, I never really thought of that either <laughs> until I really got to understand what creativity is. And what I realized was that since I started studying philosophy, okay, and which I then, you know, progressed beyond, and I got a PhD in philosophy and I started teaching philosophy, what I realized was that a lot of the philosophical ideas, even though they're very abstract, were pretty creative ideas. I mean, they were sometimes, uh, you know, I agree. agree Thoughts and say that's pretty wild. Okay, and you think about it, and it fits in, it makes sense, but it's really quite different and quite original. Okay. And what I learned was that while these were philosophical ideas, their roots were in solving philosophical problems. Mm -hmm. And I thought problem solving is really a good domain for creative thinking. You put them together and you get creative problem solving. And that's very, very important to help students to learn how to do. Not just solve problems in the 
same old that's way. That's yours too. That's right. <laughs> well, any adult. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, after your large experience working at different schools um, with different teachers, uh, can you determine if the environment can predict you're going to be more or less creative? Because we were thinking that maybe the lack of resources or the chance of having them can help you to be more creative. So maybe rich environments or poor environments help or... Well, uh, in my experience, uh, I don't think that's exactly it. I think you have to put the teacher in the class because you can have a poor environment and the teacher not really prompt the students to try to do anything but work within that context. And the same with a rich environment. You know, accept it as it is. You know, tell me what you see there. It's a, um, but, you know, thinking about, you know, I mean, environment is very general, but thinking about the way various kinds of science problems have been solved. Yeah. You know, you realize that rich or poor environment is the attitude. You know, can we mix things up a little differently and get a better way to do it? And if you're not asking, if you're asking how did other people do it, you know, maybe it'll work again that way. If you're not exploring the way. So, when we work with teachers, we really, you know, we stress the need right at the beginning for there to be a creative challenge. Okay? You're trying to do so and so. You can't quite manage it with all the resources that are available. And you're thinking, it's so important to do it. How can I do it? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's not that we have a lot of resources that we don't want to use. That's right. Working with kids and, you know, and getting them to feel that kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. How can we break out the side of the box? Yeah, exactly. Right. Then you only in the first That's right. At this point, we'd like to talk a little bit about the social role of creativity. So it's a little related with the previous question. Um, do you think that creativity can support the equity in education? So that, because maybe if you have a group of students that have, that do a lot of work in creativity terms, and then we have another group of students that they don't, so in theory they are not developing those creative skills we're talking about, maybe that is going to contribute to make the social gap bigger between them or not? Well, I, I agree, I think that does, but I think we're conceiving that of it too narrowly. So this isn't just creativity, it's anything. Yeah. I mean, if you have a group of students and one group does all the work and excels in solving these mathematical problems, and the others just sort of limp along, mm -hmm. okay, you get the same kind of issue. Yeah. You get two groups, and there's jealousy and, you know, and stress between the groups. Okay. It's a much better way to do it is to, is to set up groups that work together, where part of the rules are, you know, if there's something to be done, divide up the tasks and share it, okay? So that there, there, there isn't one group that's doing it all. And so, it, so the social sort of sharing and responsibility, that becomes the primary you know, modus operandi of these yeah. groups. And then whatever they do, they, they don't end up, you know, splitting apart like that. Okay. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about creativity in the classroom, so at schools. So first, we would like to know if you have ever met Ken Robinson? I've met Ken Robinson a couple of times, but I met him only <coughs> You know, before or after a talk he was giving, mm -hmm. he disappeared. Okay, well, so what's your opinion about this statement that the school heals creativity? What do you think about it? Well, I think that happens to be true. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, there's that old story that little kids, three, four year old, five year old kids, are wonderfully mm -hmm. creative. 
Yeah. But by the time they get to second grade, they lose it. Okay. And you think about it, why do they lose it? They lose it because the teachers impress on them that there's only one right answer. Yeah. And if you don't get that answer, you're going to get zapped in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, you know, they suppress those instincts. Now, not everybody, because we know there are kids yeah. who just, you know, buck the, the tide there. But many kids do. And if that goes on long enough, they lose it. And then it withers away. Still, there's a germ in there. You can bring it out. Okay. And I happen to think that doesn't have to be. I mean, sure, there's one right answer to certain kinds of questions. But other kinds of questions are open and you get diversity. Yeah. And a teacher doesn't have to, a teacher can promote both. Yeah. Okay. And good teachers do. So that you nurture the creativity that's coming out in these students. And at the same time, when they're doing math, you know, I mean, there's going to be one right answer to this math problem. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um. Do you consider that nowadays creativity takes place in classes, like like an actual fact? Well, I, I you know I'm not the right person to ask. Because <laughs> I work in, a te in teacher training programs in which we teach teachers so to promote creativity, so that when I, I see it happening in classes, it's wonderful. Yeah. Now I don't know if I go to the school across the street. What am I going to see? Well, I don't look at <laughs> So, yes, you know, but what I know is that it it can be promoted in every classroom. Mm -hmm. And you know, creative thinking depends on a context and what you're able to come up with. Mm -hmm. And it depends on having a certain amount of ideas in your head already that you can connect and put together yes. in new ways. So there may be maybe more that's difficult for students to really try to do that. But it's not, you know, I mean I, I just see it all the time in the classrooms. Yeah, you're yeah. Okay. So um, how do you think that it can be definitely introduced in formal education? Well, I think I mean one clear way is through problem solving. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that I don't mean mathematical problems, not, no, I, not I, quantitative. Um, and that's you know I used to think you were going to challenge students to try to solve the problem of water pollution in this community. Mm -hmm. Well, that's advanced and that's for upper grade kids, but little kids, well, maybe they can figure out you know how to make the little ones. Yeah. Put them together and what have you, but they're very limited. But I, I realize that's completely wrong. That children, little children have a tremendous amount of experience and it gets embedded in their heads and they think in terms of connections and analogies. So, I mean, I remember a teacher gave a classroom of students, and these were four or five year old students some piles of old newspapers and said, why don't you do something with these old newspapers? And I watched one student immediately, you know, he took a new piece of newspaper, put it over his shoulders, you know, as if, you know, and he tried to fasten it together. It was a little best. <laughs> I never thought of that. Okay, I mean, it wasn't going to work as a newspaper, but he got the form and the style Okay, and I remember another student, they, you know, he and, and two, these two students together were crumpling up the newspapers and they were making various forms, okay, and one of them took a scarf, a real scarf that one of these students had, and tied it on and then held it, and it was a wonderful kite with a long tail. And I thought, now these kids, I mean, what do they do? They have newspapers, and then what were they saying? They weren't saying, can I make a kite out of mm -hmm. the newspaper? They were saying, well, you know, if I crumple it up this way, what does it look like? And, 
you know, and they they that they connected what they were doing with their their experience, yeah. and they built on that. And that's for little kids. That's a way of releasing their creative yeah. Okay. I, mean, I think that's just wonderful. Yeah, it is. Right. Um, Let me take another example. Okay, for sure. <laughs> because they had talked about athletics, sports, mm -hmm. and the and so the teacher said, well, here are a lot of balls. She had maybe 15 basketballs and under uh, tennis balls and a big game. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, why don't you try to make some things out of these balls? Okay. And I, I watched four kids, they talked together and they, they took the basketballs and they put them one by one and they glued them together. Okay. So that they ended up having something else. So I said, what, what are you doing? What are you making this? And then one of them said, we're making a mattress out of the basketball. <laughs> okay. So it's connecting wow. those ideas. Yes. And that, that's the essence of creativity. Okay. Um, we would like to talk also about the role that teachers have, the role that teachers play in this, in this method that you're promoting and these ideas that you have. So, um, first, what is the importance of the teacher, of the teacher here, when they are working with the students? Well, the importance of the teacher is to guide the students. Mm -hmm. to not to tell the students what to do, not to give them ideas that they have to memorize, but help them to, to learn how to do these things themselves. And if the students can do them, the teachers can prompt them to do them more smoothly. Mm -hmm. Okay, if they can't, the teachers can guide them. Well, maybe why don't you, if you put this over here, and you put there, what do you think of that? Do what you want to do, etc. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think you put little kids together with those newspapers and have the teachers go up to lunch, and the kids will still come up with Yeah. Things. But, you know, I mean, what's the teacher going to do? The teacher may say, that you put those together that way, it looks like sad, sad person, doesn't it? Oh, yes. And they build a whole image of the sad person. So the teacher, you know, can prompt them to make those connections and things that they, they don't see. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I think that's, I think we're still in this. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> because when I think of creativity, I think of lots of things. I think of the invention of intelligence and things like that. And, and keeping at it until you made a machine that flies. Mm -hmm. okay. And so there are, are those inventions that are driven by an idea. It may take you a long time, but you know, you, you leave it and then you think, well, wait a minute, maybe I could do this and this and you put it together. So I think of, of those, those things that benefit from these. And I just can't help but, of course, think about the great works of art. Because, you know, those are, to me, those are modes of creative communication. That a, a great painting isn't just you know a bunch of colors. That painting is saying something to me about nature, okay. and so it must be that the artist has put that into the painting. And so you know, in my mind wanders. I think about paintings like Goya's painting in the Prado. Um, like the one that's called, uh, I think, the 3rd of May, 1808, or something. 2nd of May, where there are these ordinary people being executed. Okay? And you think that is a powerful message about a lot of things. I mean, what does it communicate? You look at it, and you look into the faces of these guys that soon are going to be dead, and you see what's happening. Life and death. Yeah. And that's now 
For somebody to do that, that's more than just thinking. Mm -hmm. That involves a certain kind of sensitivity. Yeah. Okay. Then, and you translate it into images that are not literal representations, but that speak to people in mm -hmm. the language. <coughs> and so, creative geniuses like that. Well, they they have to have the techniques. They have to know. Yeah. You know, they have to think about this shape. You know, these basketballs are being converted into a mattress. Okay, now that's not a powerful social image. Okay, but they've got that. But they also need to develop a sensitivity to human beings and human condition, the way the world is, et cetera, et cetera. And, and be able to use those creative techniques to put those messages into their own words. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of Rodin and the workers of LA. I mean, my God. It's, and now, so you, you think, these little kids are just developing techniques that they use. Okay, but I think that's where we all have almost an obligation Mm -hmm. to help kids to become sensitive to the way the world is mm -hmm. and help them to start to figure out how to translate that sensitivity into creative expression in one way or another. Poetry, you know, mm -hmm. like think about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And now it used to be that those people come, come along every couple hundred years. Okay. But maybe not if we're really not just relying on those those kids that happen to survive and happen to continue their creative exploration. But we're really trying to help a lot of kids develop that skill and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean I think that this creativity is being able to create something new and different. Okay, that serves a purpose. Okay, that could be a telephone, this could be a rack, or a thumbscrew. Thumb but, you know, to help kids to develop a more positive sensitivity so that they're expressing something that can affect people and improve the way we relate to each other, and that's the premium. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really have to figure out. Yeah. yeah. There is also another concept that it's the creative confidence. Because sometimes I think that it's like the key that makes you go from fear to courage, like to be able to face different situations because sometimes you think that you're not able to do it. Um, in creative terms, but not just like painting or drawing. Yeah, no, no, no. Being able to handle the world. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. I'm stuck here, I'm going to get out of okay, and I can't. Exactly. No, you don't want to say that. You came out with solutions. That's right. So, how do you think that you can improve or promote this confidence in our students? Well, I mean, one way to start to do it, it's not all the other things to do, is through fiction. Okay, is through helping students to identify with. Characters that are doing this. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out how to solve the problems, etc. Um, so, you know, you're not going to make a big thing this year of Anna Karenina and that of Oak. You're going to make a big thing, of, you know, around the world in 80 days or something like that. Okay. Um, so, that's one way to really to inspire kids. But I think another way is to really, to wherever you can, to sh to show kids, to help get them interested in inventions, things that people have produced, mm -hmm. to do something that didn't exist before, that people have a hard time doing, it. and you know, and we don't do that enough, you know. Yeah. Because of the way the curriculum is laid out. Okay, but I wish there was a focus on inventions, inventing our way through a tough world. Yeah.
Okay, so this is almost the last one. So, um, yeah. <laughs> in Espiral, in our friends association, we really focus on new technologies because we really think that our tool to, to be used in the process of teaching and learning nowadays. So, do you think they help to improve or to work with creativity, or do you think it makes them decrease or increase? Or just well, I don't know. I've never studied that and I haven't done any research. But, you know, when we think about it, some of the ways that students are taught to use new technologies, you know, filter out the creative spark. Mm -hmm. You know, they become mechanical, like this, and this, and this, and this. That's the way to do it. And, I mean, I think with new technologies, with anything, new. There, a teacher can always find challenges, things that the technology can't quite do, but maybe, you know, figure out how to put this and this together and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think that there's a kind of spirit of instruction, okay, and not just making it, you know, mechanical, okay, not just, you know, how to drive the car, your car, okay, but how to get out of tight spots and Things like that that you know you build into the instruction, mm -hmm. um, and how to make it look better. Okay. So to conclude this interview, we would like to talk just a little bit about the future. So we know that you are a lover of science fiction. <laughs> so, how did you find that out? I <laughs> know. <Sorry. laughs> we know. Okay. So. Um, how can you predict that the school of the future is going to be? Well, there I have to be <laughs> sorry to say. Because you can come up with a lot of ideas about what the school of the future might be. Might be. But there are so many variables on this planet mm -hmm. that could affect the future. And that we have no idea what's going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty. How would you like it to be then? How would I like it to be? Well, <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> that students are, students learn how to think carefully and skillfully, and they love it and they're motivated to do it, and they do it all the time, and they do it you know, with regard to everything. They explore, they think about what possibilities, you know, I'm looking at those two tables and they're up against the wall and I'm wondering, you know, what would they look like if they were sticking out this way and they had our chairs in between the tables? Would that change the way we felt and talking together or not? Well, I mean, that, that kind of thing if that's what you're talking about, that can be done. We can learn how to do that with kids, and kids will start to learn that themselves. And that's great. So that actually slides me out of a very pessimistic view about the future. <laughs> okay, so thank you for that. No, we really hope it comes through. Thank you very much. For you're welcome. Happy to do it.